we're in our Talk Back message series, where we are pushing back darkness and moving into destiny, have you been getting anything out of this message series? And have, you been able to, have you been able to incorporate it into your life in a way that is benefiting you day to day? That is the goal here. We want to bring Jesus alive into your life so that you can flourish with Jesus. That is our, that is our goal. We're going to read out of Galatians chapter 6 today, if uh, you can help me out here, Josh. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, brothers and sisters, even if, let me say this as we start. When we read the Bible here, some people, some people, like, they didn't think that you would be able to, like, have reading comprehension, right? Like, I don't want you to feel insulted. Uh, but in literature in general, you can have Shakespeare or any ancient literature, they put stanza lines. So as they study it academically, you can say, you know, this play, this act, this paragraph, right? So the, the, the verse numbers is not unique to the Bible, right? This is something that they've done in literary circles for a very, very long time. Someone finally did it to the Bible. But when these letters were written, like like when Galatians, when the when the letter was written to the church, these numbers aren't there. You know that, right? I, I know you know that. But also, these headings aren't there. And so as we read Galatians 6, it says, bear one another's burdens in my Bible. But that's not what this section is actually about. So you're like, oh, we're going to talk about... But no, that's not actually what we're talking about at all, right? Because that's not... It doesn't fit in the flow of what's happening here. So just just remember, as you read the Bible, it's, it's neat to, for it to be there, but it's not in the Bible. I was in a message one time when someone actually preached the heading. And I'll just say that's not actually the Bible. I don't know what... You, don't do that, please. Uh, anyway, so let's read this together. Verse, uh, chapter, Galatians 6.1, it says, Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you're not tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that he is someone, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason to, for boasting, but to himself alone, not to another. For if one will bear his, for each one will bear his own load. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. You say amen. Amen. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Mikey. Hallelujah. 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 The flesh is at war with the Spirit, so we need to master the flesh while we sow to the Spirit. If you get that sentence, you've got my whole message right there. This is what we want. We want... To win this war between the spirit and the flesh. We are slaves to the flesh. We can hardly control the flesh. But God promises that there is a way that you can get control over your life. And today we're going to kind of dig in the Word of God and see how does the Scripture help us to understand God, understand the enemy, and understand our own flesh so that we can walk in victory. If you're a guest today, I want to say welcome. If you're visiting us online, thank you so much for joining us today. We're in week four of our message series where we're talking back to the devil. The first two weeks we talked about the devil. Uh, the last week we started talking about the flesh and we laid out a theology of the flesh. And today we are continuing with the flesh. And we, we have identified these three areas of warfare that every person is involved in, whether they know it or not. 
Have you found this breakdown of the warfare helpful? As it, as it brought some things to light, are you starting to see it in the world? Are you starting to gain recognition of how the enemy tries to bombard us? And we've identified these three areas, and we've been working with one proposition over and over again. We've said that there is a war or a fight over our soul. The enemy absolutely wants to master our soul, wants to conquer our soul. It is our job to partner with Holy Spirit in learning how to master our own soul. And we talked about how the enemy does this. We said that deceitful ideas, you all should know this by now, deceitful ideas appeal to disordered desires that are normalized in sinful society. Does that make more sense than ever now? We get these ideas in our head, and the enemy animates them. He animates these ideas, and we talked about the primary way that the enemy works is through lies. He lies to us, so he gives us deceitful ideas, these lies that they, they feel good because our, idea, our, our desires are disordered. And those disordered desires, society says, oh, there's nothing wrong with those. That's, that's perfectly fine. Go with that. As a matter of fact, you should seek that. As a matter of fact, that's the real you. And I'm here to tell you, that's the real me. I don't want to be with me. That is not the me I want to be. What happens when the real you, the devil, tries to tell you you are is not who you want to be? What happens when the law tells you this is not a person we're going to allow to be free in society? Then we know we got a problem. When the real you comes up against reality, we learn truth. When these deceitful ideas are confronted with cold, hard facts, then we've learned truth. I want to be, this is, this is who I am. Why don't I have any friends? Why doesn't anybody want to talk to me? Why am I alone? Because the real you that you think you are is not the real you. This is who the devil has concocted you to believe you are so that you can feel lonely and outcast. But God has a better plan for your life. Amen. Today, today we're on our second week of talking about the flesh. And again, if we're going to talk about the flesh, we've come up with this kind of definition of what the flesh is. And we've said that the flesh is the base, animalistic, primal drive in us for self-gratification. If you notice when you struggle, when you're struggling in your relationship with God, when you're struggling with yourself to be at peace with yourself, it is because there is self-gratification that is not being met. This is where our disordered desires, where our mind maps, or our worldviews, or this, this, this way that we have figured out how we're going to get to the good life causes disappointment and pain because it's possible that our mind map, worldview, meta-narrative more lines up with a deceitfully normalized society than it does with God's plan. We will talk about that today. We studied in Galatians 5 last week that we are called to freedom as defined in the Bible. Now, we talked last week about how biblical freedom talks about being free from oppression, an oppression that causes us to do things that are evil, that are either uh, destructive to ourselves or destructive to society. Real biblical freedom is being able to be free from those oppressive forces, slavery, drug addiction, uh, pornography addiction, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, personality disorders, things that cause us rage, things that cause us to be uh, separate from other people. Real freedom is when these forces aren't destroying our lives or destroying society. This is real freedom, but we also talked about in modern culture in a post-enlightenment um, society, in an enlightened society, freedom is no longer freedom from oppression, but permission to do whatever we want. Freedom means nobody can tell me no. No matter if it destroys me or my life. Doesn't matter if it destroys society. If you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. No, that's 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 everybody knows that's a lie. If I don't want you at your worst, I don't care what your best looks like. <laughs> If you're telling me that you get worse than this, no, I'm good. I'm, I'll find somebody else. Thank you very much. Amen. 
do better, be better, right? Like, be better. But what we're told today that freedom is that I get to be just as nasty as I want to be, and nobody can tell me no. And this is not freedom at all. This is this, The Bible does not call this freedom. The Bible calls this bondage. Jesus did not come, us, come to give us permission to fulfill all of our carnal desires. That's, that's not the purpose of the coming. There, there, is a, there is a higher, there's a hierarchy of desires. We talked about this. And these higher desires in life, they lead to life and, and, and goodness and godliness. They lead to fulfillment. They lead to peace. But these lower desires lead to death and destruction. And, and whether or not you live within a, a Christian worldview, um, and I don't, I'm not talking politics here, I'm talking about what it looks like to follow Jesus in the Scriptures, whether you live a Christian worldview or you live a Buddhist worldview, uh, or these people, these, these um, philosophies that have created prospering societies, all kind of look at this life the same. If you study the Stoics, or, or you study the the, the the great Greek philosophers, if you if you read it, read the uh, the great writings of the Roman writers, or or the the higher thinking religions in the world, they believe that I, I, I inherently should be good. I should do good to others. I should master myself. I should help society. I should be generous. I should not focus on things I don't have control over. I should be in charge of the surroundings around me, and I should add value to the lives around me. There's other worldviews out there, other religions, that are bent on destruction. They believe that everybody who doesn't think like me, I have to kill them. I have to murder them. In any country where you see this kind of worldview dominating, they're all regressing. Have you noticed that? They're, they're, they're marching back to the 8th century. That, that's kind of the goal somehow of radicalized thinking where we consume or where we're consumed with other people's behavior instead of self-improvement. Now this happens in some religions it's baked in, but you'll see it in radical Christianity as well. Especially when Christianity gets political. All of a sudden we're more consumed with what other people are doing instead of me becoming a better person. This is why when Paul was writing letters about who's supposed to be an elder in the house of God, people get caught up in, in, in pronouns. And, but really what Paul is saying, if, if this person isn't someone that people want to be around, this is not somebody that should be an elder. If this isn't someone that you can trust, they shouldn't be a deacon. I don't care how holy they act. And so as we see this higher living, God wants us to live a way that attracts people to our lives, that we have influence in other people's lives, that we are flourishing here on the earth. He's not, he's not consumed with us fulfilling all of our fleshly desires, not even all of our mental desires. He has an entire world that is beautiful and flourishing and prospering where people live in peace and people live in health. And he's saying, what I want you to do is be conformed so that you feel at home in this world. Ah, I, I want you to be at peace, but I'm not going to do things in your life that would jeopardize you loving what I have for you. And so sometimes the worst thing God can do is give you what you're praying for. It's like when you have a little kid and they want ice cream three meals a day and you say, I know you think that's going to make you happy, but I'm going to be the one cleaning up the throw up at 11 o'clock at night. This is, this is not good. And what we see now is a society that is so bent on eating ice cream three times a day, they're throwing up all over society. They're not concerned about their own health or the health of the people around them. They're, they're hell-bent on power. They're hell-bent on control. They're hell-bent on having their little worldview protected instead of the benefit of the people around them. We read Galatians chapter 6, and uh, you can look at the heading there and think that it means one thing, but you can't really understand what we read without going back a little bit and reading the end of Galatians chapter 5. So if you're in your Bible, go back to Galatians chapter 5, and this is how Paul is setting up this entire section of Scripture. Watch this. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. 
Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. This is Paul saying, listen, there, 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 there's two paradigms that, that I'm going to put before you right now, and I need you to be cognizant that these two worlds can't live together. You say that you're a Christian, you're living by the Spirit. Hey, if we say that we are led by the Spirit, we need to be living by the Spirit. It's not just a one-time thing that we get at the altar. It's not just a, a one-time moment that we had in a worship service. It's not something that happened when we were a kid and we got baptized or, or, or we got confirmed. It is a life of choosing to live in the Spirit. Paul sets up this challenge for us. Will we live by the Spirit or will we produce the works of the flesh? And then he answers his own question, live by the Spirit. This is what he's challenging us in our everyday life to live by the Spirit. And then he goes in the, in the next verse, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, which is just a continuation of the same sermon here. He says, Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so you're not tempted as well. Man, Paul is setting up something really masterful here. He's saying, listen, you, you, you found somebody in sin, and, and, it, and, and it's gonna, your flesh is going to say, oh, finally, I'm better than this person. And the minute you do that, you're caught in the same sin. By the very measure that you judge, you will be judged. And so it's so easy, especially when your enemy sins against you, and you're like, ah, I'm better than them because what they did wrong. Paul's like, watch out. Watch your heart. Watch your heart. You're about to fall in a trap. You're about to fall in a trap. He says, instead, if you're spiritual and you see someone fall, it's your job to help restore them. Verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You see, this, this passage is not about bearing one another's burdens. This passage is about getting your heart right toward other people. Watching your own judgment, watching your own pride, watching how you view other people. Stop comparing yourself to other people at their worst so that you feel better about you. You just be good you. You just be good you and Jesus. I'm doing what I'm called to do in this. I'm not in competition with anybody else, whether it looks like they're flourishing or it looks like they're crashing. That has no bearing on who I am. I, I just think this, this, this comparison where we live in today's society, I, I'm not the first person to say this, but I just wonder, I'm just going to say this, ladies, you can hate me. I'm, I'm just going to say it. I'm just gonna get, what, how, many, how many industries would go out of business if women decided that their body looks okay the way it is? How many billionaires would no longer be wealthy if you just said, you know what, I'm pretty already. I, I, my, my, I look good the way I am. Am I, am I, are we producing some sort of religion where you don't wear makeup? No. But at the same point, people are making money off you being insecure. They are forcing you to compare yourself to other people in fake pictures in magazines. This is what Paul is warning us against. If anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself for the one must examine his own work and when he... Oh my God, here we go. And for each one must examine his work and if he has reason for boasting but to himself alone and not to another, for each one will bear his own loan. Listen, he says, instead of articulating new laws, Paul says, I'm not, I'm not setting up new laws for you. I'm not setting up new things on how you're to compare yourselves to one another or how you're supposed to live. No, no, no checklist of what is good that makes you right with God. Instead of that, he, he gives examples of being a community of believers who are spiritually mature and responsive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. What does that look like in today's society? Well, that means that we, 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 instead of sitting on your phone and doom scrolling, spending a half hour looking at the calamity of other people's lives, there's whole TV series, there's whole shows that have been on for many seasons where you get to peer into the lives of wives of famous people to see how they are destroying their lives over and over and over again. And we look at it as entertainment. We are entertaining ourselves with the foolishness of other people's lives. 
And I'm not here to police your, your television viewing, but at some point we got to look at it and say, oh, I feel bad for these people. This is, this is, this is crazy. Like, wow, this is, I, I, I can't, like, 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 like we have this war happening in the Middle East right now. And I'll tell you what, I am never watching a single one of those videos of people being murdered. I refuse to allow the murderers that are perpetuated by terrorists to be entertainment for me. I refuse to have that normalized in my spirit, man. I want to see a murdered person and I want to weep. I don't want it to be normalized in my heart. But society today tells us, like, hey, people are being murdered in the Middle East. Here's some video of it. No, thanks. I'll pass. I'll, 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 I'll pass. There, there's whole channels that you can go to online to watch murders in Ukraine and the war between Russia and Ukraine, the, the war in the Middle East. And you're entertained by the demonic, thinking that that's not going to affect our lives. Again, I'm not trying to condemn anybody on their entertainment purposes, but I am trying to stoke the Spirit of God in your life. When the Holy Ghost says, maybe this isn't best for us, that you're maybe, oh, maybe I need to just put this down. Maybe, maybe I have looked at enough celebrity gossip today. Maybe I have seen people tearing their lives up enough today. Maybe, maybe, maybe just the doom scrolling can just end a little bit early today. We, we can't watch other people's pain as entertainment. This is, this is against the Spirit of God. We, we need to be sensitive to the people around us who absolutely need Jesus, who desperately need Jesus. And we have to be trained in our spirit, man, when we see suffering people to tell them, listen, I know a man who, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was broken and I was hurt and I was, I was in pain and my life was crazy like yours, but I met a man. And his name is Jesus. And he turned my life around. And he filled me with the Holy Ghost. And he delivered me of the devil. And he put me on a new path. And he gave me a future and a hope. And he brought me a family. And he brought me people I could trust. Come on, somebody can clap for Jesus better than that. And we've got to be able to tell people, listen, there is a place where you can find freedom. Instead of just being entertained by people who are suffering, we have to see it. And God's showing us someone whose life we can speak into. We've got to cleanse our spirit, man. We've got to protect our spirit, man. The goal here is that love will be realized in our community. And that love would propel us to help people that we see in this kind of bondage. There is a spirit of generosity that first starts with spiritual matters, Paul is telling us here. There's a generosity of spirit that says, I am secure in who I am, and when you have fallen and you're broken, I have something to give. I'm not trying to climb on top of your pain to build myself up. I, I, can, I can stop and get down in your pit without fear of being seen as someone who's in the pit because I know who I am in Jesus. I'll be found with people who are hurting because I know who I am in Jesus. I'll be found with people stuck in drama because I know who I am in Jesus. And I feel compelled to walk alongside you in the midst of your pain because I have sensitized my spirit to the pain of others and Holy Spirit can move through me. Amen? I hope this is making sense. The Spirit tells us that we now have a responsibility to work hard to restore other people. That's what real maturity looks like. Real maturity is not being able to point out what's wrong with everybody else. It's not the heresy hunters who, who, are, who are boastful enough to put whole videos on YouTube about pastors they don't agree with. It's, it's about you finding some broken people in your town and helping them out. I wonder if these people, amen, I wonder if these people who spend all their time tearing down pastors they don't agree with would actually just go walk outside their house and find some hurting homeless people and sow into them if they might not experience more of the grace, peace, and love of God in their lives and see some fruitfulness. Instead of tearing down people they don't believe, they don't agree with, just go ahead and just do something that may actually not make you look like the, the all-star and just give to somebody who actually needs some help. These people think that they're accomplishing something, but the Bible tells us that they're not accomplishing anything. As a matter of fact, they've just gotten down into the mud that they think they're accusing that person of being in. You cannot be a gossip and a slanderer and be in right standing with God. Can you say amen? Amen, amen, amen. I believe it wholeheartedly. <laughs> 
But sometimes we have to confront people with their sin. We have to love people enough to say, yeah, man, I, oh, that's, I'm, I understand you're going through trauma right now. I'm going to walk with you through this trauma. But at some point, I'm going to have to say, let's talk about what led you to this place. Let, let, let's talk about how you got to this place of sin. Let's, let's, I, I have to love you enough to say, these bad choices that I know Holy Spirit was warning you about. I know that I had warned you about them. I told you that this might be an issue, this pattern. But you have to love people enough to say hard things sometimes. Amen? We've we got to do it. We gotta, and not, not in the spirit of judgment, but in the spirit of like, man, I really care about you. Like you would a child who's running towards traffic. You say, well, I told you that you're going to get hit by a car. Like that, that's not helpful. That, that, that's not helpful. But I refuse to allow you to run into this destruction. I just, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm willing to run with you towards traffic to keep you from getting hit by a car. That's what love looks like. That's how we call people out. God, I love you too much to allow you to destroy your own life like this. I, I refuse to allow you to destroy your marriage. I refuse to allow you to destroy your business. I destroy to, refuse to allow you to destroy your testimony. The legacy you're leaving your kids, I refuse to allow you to live in this because I love you too much. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, as we continue to study the Scripture here, the Bible says, The one who is taught the Word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Now, now this, is, this is what Paul, in the midst of all this, is saying, listen, um, when you're in the household of God long enough, and what he's trying to do is build collegiality, to build communities. Like, when you're in the house of God long enough, you're going to know your pastor well enough that you're going to start seeing that, that he's not necessarily the perfect person you thought she was when you got saved. Right? When you went to the altar and they, and they prophesied over you and they spoke the Word of God over you and you're, you got delivered of the devil and your life got turned around and, and you were just in awe, eventually you're going to find out this is just a, a human being that the anointing of God is upon, a person who's been set apart from the world to preach the gospel, and you're going to at some point bring that person down and say, eh, it's just another person in my life. And Paul said, watch out. Watch your heart. Watch your, guard your spirit. Because that is a that is a, a an avenue of truth in your life. I, I've seen it many times. I don't want to harp on this, but I watch people on fire for God. Their lives are wrecked. They get saved, get baptized in the Holy Ghost, maybe get married, maybe have some kids. All of a sudden, by house, they're doing well. Life's going great. They start making a little money. God starts blessing their lives, and all of a sudden, they start making themselves the star of their life story. And then all of a sudden, you can't really talk to them about anything anymore. The attitude starts to come up. Starts to come to church a little bit less. Other things become more important than the Word of God. All of a sudden, they start elevating their own ideas above what the Scriptures say and what, what they think should be instead of what the Word of God says it should be. And all of a sudden, before you know it, their life is a shipwreck and they don't even know. They completely cut themselves off from the truth. And Paul is like, hey... It's important that we, we guard the relationships that we have in the house of God. We, it's important that we guard our heart and we regulate the desires that flow in our heart. Here in Galatians chapter 6, Paul is beginning to lay out a framework of how we resist the attacks of the enemy in our flesh and how we move into the ability to regulate our own lives. And, and, it, and it goes something like this. He's saying, in the beginning, we have a choice, right? We have, we have choices. When we come upon a circumstance, we have choices. But eventually, your choices become your character. Now, if you're always on time and then you show up late one time, people are going to say, oh, yeah, I mean, something must have happened because they're, they're never late. But eventually, if you show up late all the time, all of a sudden, that's part of your character. You're not someone who shows up to places on time. We get that, right? And the more choices we make, eventually our character is established based on the choices we make. And whether or not people know the choices you're making, God knows what your true character is. We get to decide what we do with our lives. I've said this before, and I certainly didn't write it, they say when we're born, we look like our parents, but when we die, we look like our decisions. 
And the decisions we make over and over develop our character, and our character is who we really are, or whether people know it or not. But we do get to decide what to do with our lives. We have the capacity, Paul is saying here, we have the capacity to override our desires. While modern culture is telling us, don't fight it, there's no getting past it, so many people said, I tried to try to try to be a different person, but I just gave up. This is who I am. The Bible gives us a different story. The Bible tells us that through the power of Holy Spirit, you could be unable to regulate your consumption of alcohol, but by the power of Holy Spirit, you have power over that. The world may tell you, hey, this is just who you are. You know, love is free and just, it's, you know, it's not a problem with being just having physical relationships and sexual relationships with whomever the Word of God says, actually, there, there is a problem. And we know biologically, even, that we are designed to be monogamous. You're saying, not, not, not so, Pastor. A- absolutely. We know that women are more likely to get cervical cancer the more sexual partners they have. As a matter of fact, I don't know the biological words for this, but when a woman has sexual relations with the first man, we know that actually part of that male DNA gets incorporated into her reproductive organs, and it's known to accept that. And the more partners that woman has, the more likely there are to be cancerous cells in her reproductive organs. I'm not slut shaming here. That, that's not the goal at all. The goal is to say, like, you, you have power over your sexual urges. I mean, you may not today, but by the power of Holy Spirit, you, you can. You, you can learn to live a chaste life. You can learn to get these urges that, that run out of control. You're able to wrangle them into something that actually creates a character you're proud of. There's hope in. Jesus. And what happens, unfortunately, since we have power to regulate our desires and to override our desires, our freedom expands and it shrinks with each decision. Habits. Our habits become our character. And our character determines our destiny. Our habits determine our character. Our character becomes our destiny. And the more you give in to your fleshly desires, the more your character is forged in a way that it's hard to overcome. It it, it could be just like having to check your phone every 20 seconds. That you can't sit still without looking at your phone. Just doom scrolling, scrolling, death scrolling. Just, I can't be alone. Can't walk the dog without looking at TikTok. I can't go to the bathroom without my phone. How many people, do you think just how disgusting this is? You take the, the phone with you to the bathroom and you put it on your rug on your face the rest of the day, right? Like there's a, there's a problem with this. I hope it's a mental image that stays with you this week. You, you, know, you know, they say those, those hand things that they put in the, the bathroom to dry your hands off? that they have found that that multiplies the airborne amount of fecal matter in public restrooms by like like a million percent. It's like they've found how just unhealthy those are. It atomizes fecal matter so they can float through the air. I hope that's disgusting enough for you to never use them again. Like, let me just bring my phone into there. The thing I take to bed with me and I carry around and rub on my face like that. I'll use whatever it takes, amen? But these habits that determine our character, they could, I mean, a million, a million habits, both, both good and bad. It, it, it might be having to check your phone. It might be you can't go to bed without drinking wine or watch pornography or, or you have to snap back at somebody who says something you think was wrong. You don't have the control over your own temper when people do something you don't like. And the longer you choose a habit, here's the truth, the less likely you are to ever change. We become the decisions that we make. Finish this sentence for me. You can't teach an old dog. Young people don't say that. Old people say that. When they said, if I've made this decision so many times in my life, I can't change anymore. 
We know biologically we have these neural pathways. And these neural pathways are like little highways that go between thoughts and controlling our actions. And the more you do something, the stronger that neural pathway is. And so we even know biologically that the Word of God is true, that the more we do something over and over, the more likely that's who we are. And the sooner we make a change, the easier it is going to be. In our society today, one of the greatest problems that we have is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We, we know that's kind of happening today. But we see also in people's lives, as people live, the good get better and the bad, they get worse. Think, think about this. If you can think about people in their late 70s or early eight, or late 70s, 80s, maybe 90s, they're either like the most loving people you know, or they're just nasty, mean people, right? Like there's no in between. There's not people who are like, well, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with this. I'm, I'm not sure how they react to that. No, either they're always upset or they're always loving, right? I, I've talked about my, uh, one of my mentors, mothers, as she lived, as she got older, she just exuded grace. She was always loving. She was just, just like, I was like, man, if I could just be like that one day, I have no idea how that would happen. But if I could just be that loving and that passive in my old age, I would probably have a wonderful life. And then I think about people who are just nasty, who are just mean, who are never happy, and as they grow old, they're miserable, and people don't want to be around them. I don't know what you want to be like when you're old. I don't want to be isolated because I'm mean. I don't want to learn how to keep people from getting over on me my whole life and then have nobody who can get over on me when I get old. Does that make sense? And so, good people get better, generally, because they live a life trying not to be bad people. We're bad people, or evil people, or judgmental people. They just get more judgmental. They just get more bitter. And no matter how much evidence you throw at them, they refuse to believe the difference. That that's not who Paul has called us to be. He's called us to be people who are being transformed into a loving community. And then that makes us think, okay, what happens after we die? Like, we, we live this life. We see that there's the enemy. We see that there's a devil. We, we, we see that the devil lives somewhere. What, what, what happens? Well, there, there's a lot of theories. And, and let me tell you this. I'm not, I'm not going to answer this question for you. Just, just want to put that out there. But there's a lot of theories about what happens to us after we die. Somewhere around the Middle Ages, they came up with what's called eternal conscious torment, which is where we get sent to hell, and we're burning, and pitchforks, and the devil, and you know, all that stuff happening. Um, other people believe that uh, there's some sort of... Uh, 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 well, I'm not there yet. There's some sort of annihilationism where you... The good go to heaven and the die just kind of get, or the bad get kind of erased, right? The Catholics have this view of purgatory. Now, you can't find this in Scripture, and Catholics will tell you it's not really in Scripture. But what they believe is um, you live your life being acquainted with God. You live your life becoming more holy. You live your life in a way where you want to live with God, and if you actually accomplish that when you die, you go straight to heaven. and most people don't quite accomplish that, so there goes a season of being purged of the evil in our lives so that we can actually enjoy a life with God. If you look at it that way, that kind of makes sense, just not in the Bible, right? Like, if there's a lot of stuff, you're like, oh, that's great, just not in the Bible, right? It's one of those things, ah, it's not in the Bible. Uh, but we do know that the Bible says that um, not everybody's going to be saved. We know that for sure. Because there are people who believe that ultimately everybody will be saved because Jesus died for everyone, and everyone means everyone, and therefore at some point, either in the future or once they die, they'll get a second chance, and they'll all go to heaven. The problem is Jesus. You know, Jesus said, oh, that's not it. I got the wrong verse up. I'm sorry. John chapter 8, verse 21 says, I am going away, and you will look for me, and... You will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Can you find that for me, Josh? In Josh Rock. Give it up for Josh, would you? Jesus says, I mean, look, I mean, this is 
He's, he's pretty important to our story. Would you agree? Jesus is pretty important to our story. And he says, I am going away and you will look for me and will die in your sin where I'm going. You cannot come. Would, that'd be a bad day right there, right? If Jesus said that to you, Jesus talked to me a bunch of times. If he said that, bad day. Would that not, talk to your neighbor and say, they ain't talking to me. They ain't talking to me. Uh, that's not me. I know where I'm going when I die. How about you? I know where I'm going. But we know that not everybody is going to heaven. Why? Why Why would God not send everybody to heaven? I don't believe everybody would love heaven. As a matter of fact, some people would hate heaven. As a matter of fact, there's people who are living their lives in a way that they want anything but what Jesus has for them. They are living their life of choices, of arguments, of fighting, of jealousy, of immorality, of anything but the love that Jesus has for us. And if we were to look at our lives in a way that we're actually preparing ourselves to enjoy God in heaven for eternity, then we see we want to live lives that so to the Spirit, so to our relationship with God, so to a way of living that we become better and better and better. And the ultimate culmination of how we live is that we live in love and beauty and peace in heaven. This is how we're supposed to be living. But there's people who have no desire for that in their lives at all. It's our job to bring the anointing of God to them so they can get a foretaste of it and make a choice for Jesus. Amen? The anointing, the love, the grace that lives on you, and you begin sharing the Word of God with people. All of a sudden, that anointing gets on them. They're like, what? I never talk to someone about the Word, and they're like, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. Look at They're like, look, there's goosebumps. There's goosebumps on my arm. Take a look. I'm like, I know. That's the anointing of God that's upon my life. That's now on you right now. That's the Holy Ghost of God drawing you to Jesus. That's, that's why I'm doing this. I don't think you know why I'm doing this. I'm doing this so you get the goosebumps, so you know that Jesus Christ is alive, and you can make better choices than you're making right now so we can spend eternity together in heaven. Amen? This is what we do. And Jesus tells these people who think, you know, I can just do whatever I want to do. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. It means you cannot play him for the fool. Whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. Well, what's he talking about here? Well, in context, let's read it. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit eternal life from the Spirit. Now, this phrase eternal life in our Western context, we think he's talking about if you sow to the Spirit, you get heaven. But that's, that's not what this eternal life means. This is a, it's a Greek concept that means it's abundant, overflowing, never-ending, no-limit life. It's a life of God prosperity. As we sow to the Spirit, we don't reap, okay, I have something in heaven. You do. But as we sow to the Spirit in this life, this Think of a river that never runs dry, begins to flow into your life. And the more you sow to the Spirit, the more this never-ending river of God begins to come out of your life. It be- you begin to drink of it. It begins to awaken your spirit, man. It animates your holy desires. It begins to choke out the devil in your life. You begin to move into eternal life right here on this side of eternity. You get to see healing. You get to see miracles. You get to see breakthrough. You get to see your family come to Jesus. You get to see bondages broken off. God starts warning you about things to come that you get to protect yourselves from before they even get to you. There's a protection that begins to move over your family. There's a wisdom that begins to move into your finances. There's a favor that begins to move. Come on, somebody. There's a favor that begins to move on to your life as we sow to the Spirit Eternal life begins to flow right inside of your life in the here and now is what Jesus is telling us. From the Spirit, as we sow to the Spirit, we reap eternal life from the Spirit. And this is why Jesus says to these people, listen, where I'm going, you cannot come. You cannot come where I'm going. You cannot come because you will die in your sin. I'm here to let you know what we do here on earth has eternal consequences. 
Why is this important, Pastor? What we do here on earth has eternal consequences. I'm setting myself up for a great future. How about you? I'm setting my kids up that they don't repeat generational curses. Amen? Like, I'm working hard that generational curses stop in this generation. When I got saved, I made a declaration. It ends right here with me. These, these problems, these, these financial problems, these emotional problems, these sin problems, they end in my generation. I am standing like a bulwark saying, I am blocking everything that's come down, and I say, you will not have my kids, you will not have my grandkids, even to my children's children will rise up and call me and my wife blessed. That is what I have decided for my family. I hope you do the same for yours. I hope you make a decision today that my generation is the generation that breaks generational curses in my family. My kids will have it better than I have it. I am sowing towards a future I will not see, but my children's children will live in a prosperity I do not know now because of the law of multiplied returns. I believe it in the name of Jesus. I believe eternal life will come upon my children because of the decisions that I make today. You say amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe it. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm here to let you know you will. You will. One day you'll watch your kids doing something. You'll be like, that's what I know team right there. Look at that right there. That's my favor my child is walking in right there. Hallelujah. I remember sewing for that 15 years ago. I remember reading in the Bible and I caught a revelation in Galatians chapter 6 about sowing to the Spirit, and I made a decision that day. And then when these things came to me that wanted me to sow to the flesh, I said, uh-uh, in my generation it ends. And now here I am, 15 years later, looking at my son, and he's a righteous man of God. I didn't think I could ever see that in my life. I, I only know iniquity in my entire family, but a decision that I made 15 years ago, look, there's my son walking in the blessing that I claimed on that day in October of 2023. And in that little church in Boca Raton, I'm watching the gift of God manifest in my Come on, somebody. I hope you will grab a hold of this. I hope you will grab a hold of this and let it be part of your life. I hope that you would just say that my kids are going to live better than me. I'm making choices today. I'm making decisions today. I'm doing the hard thing today because my family is coming out in the name of Jesus. My family is coming out in the name of Jesus. Oh, I hope you're catching this right now. I hope you're catching this right now in the name of Jesus. Eternal consequences. I'm telling you, I am sowing. I'm being faithful in my finances, and I'm telling you, my kids are going to have a financial future that I never dreamed of because I'm faithful right now in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, property is going to come into my kids. Finances are going to come to my kids. Business opportunities because I have sanctified my finances, and the Lord is Lord over my money so that God protects it for me and my family. You say amen. Come on, I hope you come into that in the name of Jesus. Oh, I'm on one right now. The goal of this life is to be a disciple of Holy Spirit so that we're at home in heaven. We're at home where the streets are paved with gold, where there is worship happening all the time, where there is no anxiety, ain't no power bill, ain't no mortgage, no light bill. Come on, like we're, we're living in a land of prosperity. I got a, I got a, I got a mansion waiting for me. How about you? Oh, I dream about it all the time. But we are to be dis spiritual disciples. We are to be spiritual disciples. And there is spiritual warfare that is fighting to keep us out of this life. There, 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 there are spiritual laws. And since there are spiritual laws, there are forces that want to keep you from moving into spiritual prosperity. And we can't be ignorant of these things. It's not just counter habits. Yeah, I mean, if you get a hold of this today and you just make a decision that you're just going to be a better person, I, I hope you do. I want your life to be better. If you're listening to me here in person, if you're listening to the podcast later, if you're watching the video, I hope that you choose to be a better person for you, your family, and our, and our society. But there's something beyond that where the Spirit comes and helps you to be a better spiritual person. There's spiritual practices that we are to incorporate in our lives. They're called spiritual disciplines. Do a Google search. There's a bunch of them that we should incorporate into our daily lives. And I want to give you 
just a just a just a couple that I want you to focus on in this next week as we make decisions to be better people. The first one is studying scripture. We 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 we've talked about reading the Bible out loud. We we've talked about like getting this word in your life. You know how like sometimes you 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 hear a song and you know the person singing the song didn't write the song. You hear this in rap a lot. You know that somebody else wrote it. And you're like, oh, I can tell that person wrote this song because I'm so familiar with how they talk that I recognize who wrote this song. See, we get this Word of God in us so that when God speaks to us, we know, oh, that's God talking right there. I recognize, I recognize His voice now because I'm so, I'm so buried in this Word. I know when God is talking. And then you get another thought and you're like, that, hmm, that's that doesn't sound like God. That, that I'm familiar with Him. I'm familiar with him, so I'm, I know that. I'm, that's, people are like, Pastor, how do I hear God more? Well, if you want to hear God, read your Bible out loud. That's the easiest way to hear God. Get your Bible, read it out loud, you're hearing God. Right? And the more you do that, you'll hear him speak to you by your spirit. You read this Bible, you get stuck on a verse, you're like, oh, I keep forgetting. I keep reading this over and over and over again. Oh, maybe God's talking to me. Holy Spirit, my, I, I am here. My ears are open. I'm attending. Tell me what you're thinking about. We need to get this Bible on the inside of us. We have to get this Word on the inside of us so that it becomes flesh. See, we're at a war between the Spirit and the flesh. And this is, this is so important. The flesh is at war with the Spirit, so we need to master the flesh while we sow to the Spirit. It's not one or the other. It's not just self-control. It's not just doing good things. We need to. Learn how to stop sowing to the flesh, and we need to sow to the Spirit. I had a conversation with someone, and they said, uh, you know, I, was, uh, I used to be in church, and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I wasn't really getting out of a lot of it. And so now, now I just have a personal relationship with Jesus, but I, I don't go to church. And I just don't, I don't believe in it. And I, said, yeah, I, I love you, but I didn't say I love you. I thought that. I said, I said, yeah, that's... I understand how that sounds good, but if you don't go to church, you don't love Jesus. You, you cannot, the Bible is very clear, the scriptures are very clear, you cannot be a Christian outside the church. A oh, pastor saying they're going to hell? No, don't, don't say what I'm not saying. But you cannot say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I am a disciple of the risen Messiah, and I do not gather together with the saints. You are deceived. You are walking in open deception. You have made yourself the church. This is exactly what Paul is warning us against in this very passage of Scripture. It's impossible to say that I am a Christian who doesn't go to church because I don't like the church. No, friend, you like Jesus, but you don't actually follow Him. We, the church, have to recognize there is a whole group of people in the world today who have been fed a lot that you could be a follower of Jesus without actually following Jesus. This is the society we live in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not judging people. I'm not condemning people. I, I promise you, when people die, Jesus is not going to ask me where they should go. Right? So it's not me. I, I don't decide. I could say they're all going to hell or they're all going to heaven. I promise you, it will not change anything. Right? Jesus decides who goes to heaven. But it is impossible. It is impossible to believe that the Bible is the Word of God and say you could be a Christian and choose not to be a part of church. It's not in there. If that's offensive, I love you. I hope you still love me. You got to if you want to go to heaven, right? But we need to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And we have to recognize that there are lies that people believe because of hurts, and we need to be people who will restore those who have fallen from fellowship. We have to care about them enough to recognize they may be in pain. Amen. They're in hurt. Maybe they were abused. Maybe they're just stubborn. Maybe someone called them out on their sin, and we have to let them know. And God loves you. He wants you to get free of this thing. God has a better life for you. But we need to sow to the Spirit. In Romans chapter 7, Paul says there's like this. I'm almost done. Am I? Oh, I'm not ready, but I'm, 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 I'm getting there. I'm getting I'm almost. I'm getting close to being done. Just, can I have a couple more minutes? Are you guys good? I could cut out a bunch of stuff, but I'd rather not. Yeah, are you good? Are you, are you tracking with me? Okay. In Romans chapter 7, Paul, Paul he talks about the flesh in a way that he's like, 
In, in, in Romans 7.20, I, I believe I have it. He says, if I do the very thing I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. He talks about if we continue in these bad habits, that they become part of our character, and now it's not even me doing it. It's just, I have to. I don't have a choice. If I think about pornography, I have to go look at it. If I think about making that midnight call, I have to make it. If I think about having wine, I have to drink it. If I think about getting angry and what somebody did to me, I have to lash out at them. Paul's like, this is like, you may not even know this, but sin, it, it's not just something you did, it now lives in you. It's alive, producing a life you may or may not want. But whether you want it or not, it's there. And, and what we see in today's society is we're microdosing dopamine. Have, have you noticed that? We're microdosing dopamine, we're constantly. All day long, getting a little shot of dopamine here, getting a little shot of dopamine there, a little bit of gossip here, a little bit of social media there, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We're constantly living on this thrill to where we got people addicted to masturbation and addicted to scrolling on, 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 on social media, addicted to getting likes, addicted to being just the most shocking versions of themselves they can. And this can manifest a million ways. But God wants to give you power over these things. God wants to give you power over the doom scrolling. He wants to give you power over these things. It's sin that's living on the inside of you, but you have to start by recognizing this, this isn't actually me. I, I, want you to, I want you to hear this. This compulsion that you have to drink, even though you know it's destroyed your life up till now, that's not you. This, this infidelity that you're having against your spouse with illicit images or mental pornography, that's not actually the real you. The you who, who wants it to be normalized in society, that's not the real you. That's sin living on the inside of you, lying to you, telling you that's who you are. But I'm here to tell you, I've read this book and that's not who you are. You are created in your Father's image. Father God in heaven had dreams of you, and He created you, and He sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross for you so that you could have power over this sin, that you could be saved and live in eternity with Him, but not just that, but that you can receive the Holy Ghost here and now and have power over sin and be the person you were created to be. He said, Amen. This is who you really are. This is who God sees you. This is what Paul says is the answer. As we read in Galatians chapter 6, we need to sow to the Spirit and we need to master the flesh. Sowing to the Spirit, mastering the flesh. You didn't get in this hole overnight. You probably aren't going to get out of it overnight. It's going to take a little discipline. It's going to take choices. It's going to take you saying, I have more to gain by being godly than I'm gaining by microdosing dopamine. Real quick, I'm going to break these two down. Sowing to the Spirit. This is where spiritual disciplines come into play. I want to talk about three really quick. Evangelism. Tell people your story about Jesus. You want to grow in the grace of God? You want to discover the spiritual gifts in your life? You tell people your story about Jesus. I, I, I'm here to tell you, God really cares about the lost. Like, He cares so much, He sent His Son to die for them. Right? That's how much He cares about lost people. And when you start talking to people who are not following Jesus, you start talking to them about Jesus, the Holy Ghost shows up. The Holy Spirit shows up and begins giving you words you didn't even know you had. You start quoting scriptures you didn't even know you knew. You start having solutions to problems you knew didn't come from you. Words of knowledge start to come. Words of wisdom start to come. All faith starts to manifest. I was talking to a brother this week about uh, giving a Bible. He had this person on his heart. He really wanted to give them a Bible. I'm like, awesome. Put some faith on this person. Talk about Jesus. Because you talk about Jesus while you give them this Bible. Faith is going to fall on you and on the person. This is how we activate the gifts of God in our lives. As you begin to, you can just tell me, man, I, I know you're going through a hard season. I don't have all the answers. Here's the card to my church. You might want to come. I'm encouraged by going there. You don't have to fix other people. Just tell them your story. When you give someone a Bible, tell them, man, hey, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not telling you you got to believe this or anything, but 
I have found peace and comfort in this book. I just hope you can too. Read this book of Psalms, and I, I have found in the lowest parts of my life when I read this book, like, it helps. God somehow becomes more clear, and I just get more hopeful. Oh, or you tell people, hey, I, I know you don't believe in church, or you got hurt by church, or that there were problems with church in the past, and your mom went to this kind of church, and they said this kind of thing to you. I don't know about all that. All I know is I, I just go to this little church on Sunday mornings, and, and, and I leave feeling encouraged. And I think we all could use a little bit of encouragement in this day and age with everything that's going on. It's, it's not that complicated. You don't have to lead them to Jesus. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to have all the theological answers. You just got to know where they can go and counter life and learn to start going to the Spirit. You say amen? Second one, not popular in our society, is confession. You get somebody, hopefully in this church, that's been saved a little longer than you, and you ask them, can we just walk together for six months? And you just read Bible with them, and you confess your sins. This is what it says in James. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. Some of you, you're, you're, you're sick with sin. You need healing. And it's not going to come until you confess it. It says in this context, we like to quote this out of context, in this context, a prayer of a righteous person, when it's brought about, can accomplish much. It's not just any person praying anything anywhere can avail much. I don't know. In the midst of confession, maybe you've prayed a thousand times that God would break this habit in your life. And it didn't happen. What are you going to do? It's time to confess. It's time to come to an elder. Time to come to an older brother and sister in the Lord and say, listen, I'm, I can't stop masturbation. I can't stop pornography. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop gossiping. I don't want to look at this stuff and I can't stop when you pray for me. And then you don't give advice. Don't be their therapist. Don't be their judge. Pray. Pray the prayer of faith that they may be healed, and then you don't tell anybody about it. This is holy. This, this is when, when someone confesses, when you tell me something that's going on in your life, people, it's, it's funny because my, my wife meets with people, and uh, <clears throat> you know, she, she's a professional therapist, so, and when she meets with therapy clients, it's, it's illegal for her to talk about it, so... We never have those conversations. But when she has pastoral conversations with people, she doesn't tell me about it. She'll run to me like, oh, that's what's going on in Joanne's life. Like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care, number one, and I don't want to gossip about her, number two. It's just like, I've been in ministry long enough that I've heard it all. None of it's going to surprise me. None of it's going to interest me, right? I just want people to be healed. And so I'll meet with people, and they'll be like, they'll tell me something. I'm like, oh, yeah. And they're like, you know, I've been talking to Pastor Tracy about this. So it's like, no, I, I, I don't know about that. We don't gossip about you. That is not what we do. I, I am an ordained pastor. I have, I, one day, I'm going to stand before the throne of God. And I'm going to answer about what I do behind the sacred desk. I am going to answer for how I shepherded you. The people who want to tear down ministers, they think that they won't have to answer. But I have to react like a pastor because I will answer for that one day. And when someone confesses sin to you, that is holy. That, 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 that's, you just created a holy moment. And you, if you were to go and take that and gossip, oh, you're sinning against God. And so when someone confesses, you, you take that with you. Don't, 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 oh, can you just pray for this person? Because I can't tell you what they're going through, but, you know, they're going through something. Like, no, don't do that. That's it. Don't do that. Don't do that. The prayer of the righteous, just believe they're healed. And now if you're talking about it, you're talking about the old them. And so when you confess it to me, people are like, oh, God, I'm like, I promise you, I probably won't even remember it because I got enough going on in my own life, right? I'm not memorizing your sins. I got other things going on, right? I got things going on. But confession, get brave enough and humble enough to get out of this thing. And number three, we talked about reading the Bible. And here, as a church, if this is your church, you have homework this week, we are going to normalize reading the Bible together. We're going to read the book of Ephesians this week. There's six chapters in Ephesians. Watch this aggressive. One chapter a day is all we're going to do. And what I want you to do is I want you to read the book of Ephesians, pray that the Lord would speak to you, and post something to that social media that you've been doom scrolling 
Hashtag Ephesians. Hashtag Revival at Church. Hashtag Devil Get Out My Life. Whatever you want to do. But we all are going to post something that spoke to us this week, each day, out of that chapter. Now, I know for those who aren't math majors, the first day is tomorrow. So we're reading Ephesians chapter 1. Tuesday, that there's a little hint there because we weren't sure you're going to catch on. Tuesday, we're going to read chapter 2. Wednesday will be 3, and then Thursday's 4. You get this right all the way through Saturday, which is 6, and since there's 6 chapters in the book of Ephesians, by the time we come next week, you should have 6 social media posts and 6 chapters of the Bible read and a whole book in your belt, right? Now, you only got 65 left to read the rest of the Bible, right? We're just jump-starting this, right? We're going to normalize this. We're going we're gonna to normalize, we're gonna, we're gonna normalize just reading the Bible as a community together. Amen? And our goal here is that we will master the flesh. It's hard for us to stay still these days. It's hard for us to sit still. Again, in the beginning, we have a choice, and our choices become our character. We get to decide what we're going to do with our lives. Come on up, Mike. I'm going forever here. I've got I to I I I bring this in for a landing. Watch out for that. The longer we choose a habit, the less likely we're ever going to change. I want to choose habits that I don't want to change. Amen? I want to choose habits that sow to the Spirit so it's just part of my life. I steward the presence of God in my life. That's who I am. I, 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 I want to I wanna be old. I want to be that old guy that people want to be around because i got something good to say all the time. I want to be that giggling, laughing old guy. <laughs> oh, good to see you today. That's who I want to be. I don't want to be that nasty, crotchety person that people are like, oh, he's just like that. And I want to give you a shortcut on how you can be a little bit better. <laughs> Now, the easiest way to move into God's grace is to move into forgiveness. We've all been wronged, amen? We all got people we could be bitter with right now if we want, amen? Is it just me? Here's what I have found. I have found some people are so wounded their forgiver is broken. Right? This, this, the ability to forgive is completely broken. And, and, and we don't always do people justice when we find out that something terrible has happened to them and we tell them, you need to forgive. It's, the bridge has not been built for forgiveness yet. They've not received forgiveness from God. Their heart is still wounded in protecting themselves. And what they hear you say is, what that person did to you is not a big deal. Now, as we're mature in Christ, forgiveness should get easier. And so I would challenge you if you're mature in Christ, this week, think, 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 think of those people who are trying to drag you down to where they are by doing you wrong and choose forgiveness. Choose to forgive them. But... It's not going to be easy. All of this lies in what's called the mortification of the flesh. We want to kill the desires of the flesh, and our flesh wants revenge. Our flesh wants those people to hurt the way they hurt us. But forgiveness gets us out of that cycle. But you may not be able to do that. You may be at a place that you are so bound by offense, so bound by sin that's happened against you, you have not been able to forgive. I'd like you to ask Jesus to forgive you for that. But I want you to look at this a different way. If you can't fully forgive, I want you to think of it like this. I'm not dragging that thing into this season. You may need to go back four weeks to the message, it's a new season, and listen to it again. But I'm here to tell you, we are in a new season. And you don't want to bring last season's garbage into this season. The, the, 
the, the, the nation of Israel had a year of jubilee where all of their debts were forgiven. And you don't want to bring last year's debt into this year of jubilee. And so what you need to do is you need to, when that pops up in your heart, when the offense pops up in your heart, when you get angry about what they did, when you know how they sinned against you, you may not walk in forgiveness. But I want you to be able to say, uh-uh, I'm not going to bring that into this place. I'm not going to think about that anymore. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to meditate on that. I'm not bringing it into this season. One day, by God's help, I will forgive them. But at least right now, I'm cutting off the bitterness. I'm cutting off my anger. I'm not going to allow them to get me worked up any longer. I refuse to give them the power over me that they want. I'm not bringing it into this season. When you get the urge to look at things on your phone that will not be sowing to the Spirit, I want you to say, I'm not bringing that into this season. I may not have victory over it yet, but I'm not bringing it into this season. This is a season of the Spirit for me. This is a season of prosperity. This is a season of overcoming. This is a season of new levels and new directions and new horizons and new blessings. I can't bring that into this season. One day I'm not going to desire it. That's not today. Today I really want to sin. But I can't bring it into this season. I'm not going to bring it into this season. The famous book to pastors, a man named Jack S. Wine, wrote this. Almost anything in life that truly matters will require you to do small mostly overlooked things over a long period of time. These are the things that develop your character. Choosing the Word of God. Choosing forgiveness. Choosing to bless and not curse. Choosing righteousness. Choosing to be loving. Choosing to be generous. Choosing to be present when you want to be somewhere else. This will take time. And finally, I'm going to end with Paul in our scripture. He says, let's not become discouraged in doing good. So many times we hear that scripture where it's like when things are going hard, don't be discouraged in doing good. That's not what Paul is saying at all. What Paul is saying, hey, there are believers who get saved and their lives go from being trash to being something good. And then they get bored with Jesus. Maybe they got a business, they're starting to make money, or they finally have a stable family, they have kids. Life is going good, and now they need a new fix. And Jesus doesn't really scratch the itch like it used to. Paul's like, watch out, that's another plan of the devil. Church was important to you, but now I got these other things that my says, whoa, watch out. Don't be weary. Don't become discouraged in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially those who are in the household of faith. This, this, this is what Paul is telling us as a church. Don't be weary in doing good. Stand with me. We're going to pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what's going to happen now. I'm going to pray. And while I pray, Holy Spirit is going to move in this room. And some of you, some of us, need to come to the altar to get free of some stuff that we don't want in our lives. We love you, Jesus. I am tired of seeing God's people tormented. I'm tired of depression running roughshod over God's people. I'm tired of discouragement. I'm tired of perversion. I'm tired of lies being perpetuated in the name of Jesus. And today, and today, we are going to break that. Break that in the name of Jesus. We're going to pray in the name. We're going to pray in the name.
going to invoke the mighty name. We're going to invoke the masculine name. We're going to call on the angels of God. We're going to call on the Spirit of God. We're going to call on the blood of Jesus. We're going to call on the power of God. We're going to quote the Word of God. And we're going to see freedom coming from people's lives in this place today. In the name of Jesus, lift your hands to the Lord right now. And just begin to confess your sins to Him and ask Him to set you free. Father, in the name of Jesus, let Him know what you need. Let Him know what you need. Father, I need control in my life. I need to be able to control what's happening with my heart. I need to control what's happening with my eyes. I need to control what's happening with my tongue. I need to control what's happening with my anxiety. I need to believe the best and not the worst. I need to bless and not curse. I need to believe that God is on my side. I believe this. I need to stop catastrophizing every situation. I need to be a blessing to people who have not been a blessing to me. I need to be nice to my kids, even though they try my very last nerve, even though I feed them and they don't say thank you. I need to continue to be a good parent to them. I need to be present to people who aren't present for me. I need to continue to show to the spirit and not to the flesh. And I now declare, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus sets you free right now. In the name of Jesus, I command every foul and wicked spirit that would move in this place. I command every demon from hell that has attacked himself to the child of God. Loose the child of God. Loose the child of God. Loose the child of God. Be free in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. In the name. In the name. In the name. Come on, pray out loud. Pray out loud. If that's you and you need freedom, I am holding back the hand of the enemy.